This video is sponsored by Squarespace. More on them later. There were a few comments on my last handful of ground effect vehicle videos that said, that's not a ground effect vehicle, it's just an airplane flying low. And that made me think to myself, well, yeah, isn't that kind of what an RC ground effect vehicle is? This led me down a rabbit hole of searching all across the internet to try and find a proof of a single RC ground effect vehicle that was incapable of flying out of ground effect. Turns out that's easier said than done. So this video is part one of a several part series that is all about trying to figure out if it's actually possible to build an RC ground effect vehicle that is capable of taking off from the water and sustaining flight, but is incapable of flying out of ground effect. We'll define out of ground effect as any altitude that is above half the length of the wingspan high. This is the classical definition of where the ground effect is felt. The reason why it's so difficult to find a vehicle that can only fly in ground effect is because it takes a lot of power to get up off the water. If it has enough power to get off the water, then surely it has enough power to fly high. So that's the big challenge here. I'm also going to take a look at a few full scale ground effect vehicles and try to figure out if they are capable of flying out of ground effect or not. Apparently ground effect is more powerful with larger aircraft, so it does seem much more likely that the full scale ground effect vehicles are actually incapable of flying like a normal airplane. When I started thinking about this, the first thing that came to mind was the Caspian Sea Monster. It's by far the most popular ground effect vehicle out there, so surely it's incapable of flying out of ground effect, right? That's what I thought at first, but after looking into it, I now feel like it was probably capable of flying out of ground effect. My first reason for this is that I found several sources that say the intended operating altitude of the aircraft was between 3 and 14 meters, but it was found that the most efficient cruising altitude was actually 20 meters. The aircraft has a wingspan of 38 meters. Half of that is 19 meters. By our classic description of ground effects coming into play below half the aircraft's wingspan in altitude, the Caspian Sea Monster would have not actually been in ground effect at what is apparently its most efficient altitude of 20 meters. Now it's not quite that simple because ground effect doesn't just disappear at a certain point, it just gets exponentially less effective as you go up. So there could still have been some ground effect at 20 meters, but I feel like it would be pretty minuscule, and really no different than flying at 50 or 100 meters in altitude. My second argument is that the aircraft had 8 NK87 turbojet engines that produced 229,000 pounds of thrust at full throttle. The only reason they needed this much thrust was to get up off the water. Once airborne, they would throttle back 4 of the 8 engines because so much less power was needed to cruise. To me, it seems like if the pilot really wanted to, he could have definitely throttled up all eight engines and climbed up out of ground effect, especially if the aircraft wasn't fully loaded with its max payload of half a million pounds of cargo and a bunch of missiles on top. Although I think it's unlikely, I do think that it might be possible the Caspian Sea Monster was incapable of flying above ground effect. Reason being is that it had a clever mechanism to help it overcome the huge amount of power that was required to get up off the water. This mechanism was called PAR thrust. PAR stands for Power Augmented Ram. This is where thrust from the engines was vectored downwards under the wings to form a high pressure pocket of air and lift the vehicle up like a hovercraft. In this picture, you can see how the thrust vectoring nozzles on the left are pointed down in the takeoff position. I do think that utilizing PAR thrust was crucial for this aircraft to get up off the water, but I don't think that it reduced the maximum power requirements enough to make it incapable of flying above ground effect. Unfortunately, we might never know what this aircraft really could or could not do, because now it's rotting away on the beach. So continuing on with my research. I scoured the internet, but I could not find a single video of an RC ground effect vehicle that could fly low to the ground, but not high. I did rediscover the work of Graham Taylor. He built a bunch of cool hovercrafts and wing-in ground effect vehicles back in the early 2000s. All the videos on his YouTube channel are pretty low resolution, but from what I can tell, None of the aircrafts are actually fully flying without periodically skipping over the surface of the water. These look really close to being full ground effect vehicles, but the video just does not quite prove it. There is one caption on his website that claims there is no visible wake except of that caused by the airflow, but none of the videos really prove this. Also there's no talk of whether or not they can fly above ground effect. Moving on. This is the airfoil flare boat, designed by Gunter Jurg. It's definitely the best example I've been able to find of a real ground effect vehicle. There are pictures and video of it clearly flying right above the surface of the water, but not actually coming in contact with the water at all. Pretty awesome. The most impressive part to me is that it doesn't even use power augmented ram thrust. The motor is in the back, and to get off the water, it's purely reliant on forward airspeed to trap the bubbles of high pressure air under the wings. This, however, also makes me feel like it probably does have enough power to fly above the ground effect, 
but I doubt it can because it doesn't look like there are any elevons for pitch and roll control, and the orientation of the wings make me think pitch would be very unstable in normal flight. So my question now becomes, would this design work as a small scale RC model? That's what I'm going to try and find out in this video. I did find a clip of Gunter Jurg's small scale model test platform, but unfortunately there's no video of it in action. So I got to work designing my own. This is what I came up with. There are some big differences between mine and the real flare boat. The biggest being the airfoil selection. I chose a negative cambered airfoil for some reason. Probably wouldn't have in hindsight. I'll explain why later. To convert all the fuselage parts from CAD into real life, I CNC cut them out of pink XPS insulation foam on my Stepcraft M1000. I would say this method is actually more labor intensive than building a plane out of foam board. The actual CNC cutting you see here is obviously not that hard, but it's the workpiece setup and the tool path generation that's the labor intensive part. The benefit to this method is that you get very precise and lightweight parts. After CNC cutting, I gave the parts a quick sanding to remove all the little ridges from the end mill, careful to suck all the foam dust up into my cyclone separator. After that, I gave all the parts a layer or two of polycrylic to seal up the open cell foam and give it a nice smooth surface finish. Big thanks to Windcatcher RC for hotwire cutting the wings for this project. Check out Windcatcher RC for RC plane building supplies and parts. I'm putting elevons on this aircraft so that I can control pitch and roll. I cut these out of the wing and used packing tape as hinges. It's always so satisfying to assemble CNC cut parts because they almost always just fit together perfectly. Here's installing the control linkages and cutting little servo bays. I'm using an Omnibus F4 flight controller running ArduPilot. I'm only really using it for the flight stabilization. No GPS is connected. There's a Dragon Link in there too. Way overkill, but it was just already set up with this flight controller. Then I glued the two halves of the fuselage together with Gorilla Glue, and I also glued on the vertical stabilizer. Next I attached the motor mount. Unlike the airfoil flare boat, I am using par thrust for this model. So there's a servo that tilts the motors up and they blow air down underneath the wing. Kevin from the YouTube channel Think Flight and I worked on a ground effect vehicle model for the flying ship company last year. It utilized a very similar pivoting motor setup to what I have on this model. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to play around with the par thrust on the Flying Ship Company's model very much, but from the little bit of testing I was able to do, it seemed like it might be especially helpful in choppy water, so I was looking forward to playing around with par thrust more on this model. I installed some carbon tubes through the wing and fuselage to stiffen everything up, and gave the bottom another coat of polycrylic to smooth it out even more, and also sanded that down a bit to get rid of any bumps. The motor tilt servo was on a three position switch on the radio, and with the motors in the steepest position, it definitely seemed to float like a hovercraft pretty well. First day on the water, right off the bat it was doing a really good job of just hovercrafting around, barely contacting the surface of the water. This was cool and all, but the goal was to make a ground effect vehicle, not a hovercraft. With the motors tilted up, I was not able to gain enough speed to really fly. And with the motors tilted down, it would just kind of pop up the rear end and nose down into the water, and also not be able to build up any speed. So I had to find the optimum motor angle somewhere in between that would allow me to build up as much speed as possible before transitioning the motors down for maximum speed forward flight. I tried a bunch of different motor angles, but I was just not able to get it up to speed. So today I have a 4 cell battery in it, and I have the max PWM for the motors turned way down. So it's got roughly about as much power as it did last time, maybe a little more. And then I'll increase that power until something interesting happens, I guess. <laughs> oh, we got a little too much power. Wow, did you see that? It just popped right up. <laughs> what? That's crazy. It's just floating. So with the motors in this position, when I throttle up, the back kind of pops up more than the front. And then if I put the motors all the way down, the back still pops up. <laughs> I adjusted the motor angles, so now that when I raise the throttle, the whole thing kind of levitates up evenly. Despite the increase in power and finding the optimum motor angle for par thrust, I was still not able to get it fully airborne. The next day, I took it out to the field to see if I could get it to fly like an airplane. That way, I could make sure the CG was correct, the motors were actually powerful enough to sustain flight, and the flight controller was tuned decently well. After a few failed attempts that were caused by it being too nose-heavy, I finally got it flying. 
It did not fly well by any means, and I don't think it would have been able to fly at all without active pitch stabilization, because this aircraft is aerodynamically unstable on the pitch axis. But this test did show that the max motor PWM that I had the flight controller set to was just barely enough power for it to fly, so it seemed like a good value to continue using for the ground effect vehicle tests. Unfortunately, the foam on the underside got pretty chewed up by the turf, so I gave it a layer of 2 ounce fiberglass. This was much smoother than the polycrylic was, so I was hoping it would help build up speed on the water. When I was flying like an airplane at the field, I had to rebalance the center of gravity to make it more tail heavy. Now when trying to take off from the water, the aircraft would just flip upwards once it had enough airspeed. Not ideal. The real airfoil flare boat was supposed to be pretty aerodynamically stable in ground effect, so there was clearly something wrong with my altered design. It's likely to be either the motor positions or the airfoil profile. So this is a bummer, but at least I was having quite a bit of fun in hovercraft mode. It's pretty fun to just kind of float around while barely touching the water. It's barely touching the water. So this is clearly flying to some degree, but I would say it definitely does not count as what I'm trying to do. The motors are still at a super steep angle, so it's really more of a hovercraft than an airplane. Or a ground effect vehicle for that matter. It's also still pretty frequently touching the water. I'm trying to fly completely independent of touching the water. The next day I tried mapping the motor tilt servo to the elevator output. This caused the motor tilt to be actively stabilized on the pitch. It seemed to work a little better, but this was really just putting a software band-aid on an aerodynamics problem. Then I decided to do more testing on dry land to eliminate the water resistance variable and make it more easy to get up to speed. This revealed some really odd aerodynamic characteristics. With enough airspeed, the vehicle would just kind of skim on its nose, essentially like riding a nose wheelie. But then, with any amount of up elevator and trying to force the tail down, the whole thing would just pitch up and try to fly out of ground effect. To try and fix this, I cut some flaps in the front wings to increase the angle of attack. So I cut some flaps here. They're just static flaps, they don't actively move, but I basically just dropped it all the way down so that the trailing edge of the front wing is basically on the ground. This really didn't do too much at all. I think what was actually going on was that when the motors were in their flat upwards position, some of the prop wash was still making its way under the rear wing, causing par thrust in the back but not the front. There was some good evidence of this. When I would get up to speed and then cut the throttle, the back would come down and it would kind of skim perfectly. I didn't really get too much good footage of this but you can kind of see it here in this clip. After that I ditched the propellers and mounted an EDF on the front. Since before I was using differential thrust to steer, I added a mini rudder behind the EDF to vector the thrust around. This setup seemed to help the pitch stability a bit, and it was easier to control, but there was still seemingly no natural feedback loop for staying in the ground effect. So in other words, this is a terrible ground effect vehicle. I don't blame this on the airfoil flare boat design, but rather the modifications I made to it, being the airfoil shape and angle of attack. The negative camber airfoil I'm using has a strong negative pitching moment, which means it always wants to rotate downwards. This would be okay if it were mounted on a normal plane with a nice big horizontal stabilizer, but this aircraft does not have that. For one final experiment, I glued on some big foam wings and a tail. This made it fly a bit more easily, but it still did not have any natural tendency to stay in the ground effect. So that's pretty much it for this video. In the next video, I finally cracked the code for making a true RC ground effects vehicle.
And then in the next video after that, I revisit the airfoil flare boat design and apply what I learned from this video to make it work properly. So stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe. Big thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Recently, I've been using Squarespace every single day. I use it to create and update my websites and for all the e-commerce stuff for the Snowcat project. Recently, Colin and I have been packaging up all the second batch of RC Snowcat kits and getting them shipped out. Squarespace has made this so much easier for us for every step of the process. Customers can buy the Snowcat kit off my Squarespace website, and then the order shows up in the orders page where I can see which ones have been fulfilled or not. All the inventory is automatically kept track of, and I can easily add or remove stock to match exactly what we have crammed into the basement. Then once it's time to ship, we use the Squarespace extension for ShipStation. That makes it super easy to purchase and print all the shipping labels. And after that, UPS comes and picks up all the boxes. Now Squarespace has new features that allows you to connect with your audience and generate revenue through gated, members-only content. Manage your members, send email communications, and leverage audience insights, all in one easy-to-use platform. Create a community on your Squarespace website with a fully integrated commenting system that supports threaded comments, replies, and likes. Use their powerful blogging tools to categorize, share, and schedule your posts, too. Go to squarespace.com for your free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash rctestflight to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.